This is the fifth in a series on the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene. War is a state of conflict between opposing nations, societies, or groups. A strategy is a plan of action or a policy designed to achieve a major overall aim. I did not intend for this series to glorify the violence of war, but rather the strategies and examples given will encompass all manner of human conflicts. And although you may never find yourself in a physical confrontation, and you may pride yourself in the avoidance of violence, these strategies may prove useful in confronting and overcoming obstacles that stand in the way of your goals and desired achievements. Strategy 6. Segment your forces. Controlled chaos strategy. Part 1. Speed kills. The critical elements in war are speed and adaptability. The ability to move and make decisions faster. Robert Greene. Mobility and adaptation are essential to the success of any military endeavor. As I stated in strategy two of this series, it was humanity's use of horses that aided military campaigns for thousands of years prior to the industrial age. There is no greater example of this than the Mongol Empire of the 13th and 14th century. Prior to the unification under Genghis Khan, the Mongols were spread across the Eurasian steppe. This sea of grassland that divides the continent provides the perfect conditions for packs of horses to thrive in. These nomadic tribes would compete with each other over territory and hunting grounds, only occasionally becoming involved in disputes in China, Europe, and the Middle East. Until the 12th century, when Genghis Khan was able to unite and conquer the warring tribes, forging them into a united fighting force that went on to create the greatest continuous empire in world history. As a testament to the strength of an entirely mounted military at this time, the massive empire once stretched from the Sea of Japan to Eastern Europe and the Iranian Plateau, extending north into parts of the Arctic and southward into the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia. It wasn't just horses that made Genghis Khan's army so powerful. It was the adaptation of the tribal leadership into modern segmented decimal forces, such as the Arvans, which consisted of 10 soldiers, Zuns of 100 soldiers, Mighans of 1,000 soldiers, Tumans of 10,000 soldiers. They also divided the Imperial Guard into day guards and night guards, ensuring every soldier knew their duty. Leaders were chosen from the ranks not because of nobility or tribal affiliation, but through a system of merit and loyalty to the Khan and the Empire. These systems allow the army to divide up quickly and adapt to any threat or changes in terrain without losing control or leadership. Moving into the modern age, in the planning of the invasion of the nation of Iraq in the 1991 Gulf War, General Colin Powell had a turn of phrase, speed kills. The strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. Turning a modern mantra of transportation safety into a strategy of war. Following the debacle of the Vietnam War, of which Powell was a veteran, the U.S. people and the leadership were cautious to entering a new conflict. The Powell Doctrine, called for the use of a far numerically superior force with advanced technology and superior mobility. This doctrine would not only ensure victory, but also a quick end to the conflict. The first invasion of Iraq is depicted in the 2005 film, Jarhead, which follows a Marine through his boot camp, placement into elite sniper recon unit, and the eventual invasion. The film shows how quickly outpaced the more traditional ground-based marine unit was compared to the mechanized and airborne unit. Dialed in! We gotta find the fucking get out! Fuck. Whopper, you get on the vinyl! Boy, get on that radio! Hey, Sam, you're too fucking slow! They already retreat! Hey, those are A-10s! War dogs, baby! The conflict ended so quickly and definitely that the marine never even fired a shot in the conflict. Part 2. Calculated Disorder But speed and adaptability are hard to achieve today. We have more information than ever before at our fingertips, making interpretation and decision making more difficult. We have more people to manage, and those people are more widely spread. We face more uncertainty. Robert Greene there is a wonderful turn of phrase that was used to describe how the American government could be so susceptible to a terrorist attack in 2001. It was described as an intelligence failure. 
The terrorist attacks were a tragedy, but the term intelligence failure is a wonderful phrase to describe a lack of preparedness in the face of a known or suspected threat. But was it a failure of intelligence? We certainly had intelligence at the time. There were several branches of government dedicated to intelligence, and the nation has many of the world's best institutions of higher learning. Both public and private institutions were well aware of growing animosity within the geopolitics of the world towards America. What then America was really lacking was imagination and certainty, not intelligence. We were aware of a threat, but what we lacked was the imagination to create certainty. This is reminiscent of another tragic intelligence failure preceding the Japanese attack of Pearl Harbor in 1941. In the Pacific Ocean prior to World War II, radar technology was in its infancy. Ships and whole fleets could disappear into the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and reappear without notice. The inventions of the submarine and the aircraft carrier more than doubled the stealth and lethality of a naval strike force. It was a war of chaos to those who were not prepared and vigilant. There are several films that depict the attack on Pearl Harbor, and each, in their own way, document that during the lead-up to the Japanese attack of Pearl Harbor, there were several veiled messages and hidden clues to what was coming, and the U.S. Intelligence Department did suspect there was an attack coming. Remember those five troop ships? Well, they're still heading south with a naval escort only 14 hours from the coast of Malaya. What about their aircraft carrier? We don't know. Intelligence was keeping track of them until recently. Now we've lost them. I am still convinced they're going to attack us. See, none of the major sea lanes go through it. And you could bury the entire landmass of Asia there. From there, they could attack anywhere. The Captain Thurman of Naval Intelligence here has his own theory about the missing ships. Sir, I believe they'll try to hit us where it'll hurt us the most. Pearl Harbor. Your theory is based on what? Well, it's what I would do. It's not exactly hard evidence, Captain Thurman. Sir, we can read their diplomatic codes faster than they can type them. The Captain Thurman's cryptology team is still trying to crack the naval codes. It's like playing chess in the dark. Any rumor, troop movement, ship movement, spine tingle, goosebump, we pay attention to it. Then break the damn naval code, Captain, so I can make a better decision. Aye, sir. We are trying. The 2019 film Midway also depicts the events of Pearl Harbor leading into the naval battle of Coral Sea and the titular Battle of Midway. The story focuses on the bruised ego of the United States and the naval intelligence officers that are ultimately responsible for monitoring the actions of the enemy forces in the Pacific Ocean. The naval intelligence officer in the film, a composite of historical characters played by Patrick Wilson. What makes him think that? A little. Uh bits and pieces that we've intercepted. A message about a battleship not being ready for an upcoming operation, a request for maps of the Aleutian Islands. What's the target? We don't know yet. Do you trust this officer? He's the most brilliant man I know. Well, I haven't figured it out. Is ordered by the historical character, Admiral Nimitz, played by Woody Harrelson, to find certainty amongst the sea of incomplete and uncoded Japanese messages, so that the hobbled but not crippled U.S. Pacific Fleet can mount defense against the next attack, and buy time so that the U.S. can continue to rebuild its fleet. Translation and analysis. Now, Washington agrees with us that Japs are going to attack a major target codenamed AF. But Washington believes that AF is located in the South Pacific, which is why they ordered you to keep Enterprise down there. Do you have any direct proof that they're wrong? Direct proof, no. I'll figure a way to get the Enterprise back here. Meantime, you gentlemen need to convince Washington that the Japs' real target is Midway. With the U.S. fleet outnumbered, the Japanese fleet knew that they could afford to take risks that the U.S. fleet could not. Naval intelligence was able to find the code word for the next target of the Japanese naval assault. That was Washington. They've intercepted several Japanese messages claiming that the target of their upcoming attack is out of fresh water. Interesting, sir. I heard that Midway accidentally sent out an unencrypted transmission that their water plant was broken. 
But that proves Midway is AF. In order to uncover the exact name of the target, they employ an intelligence gambit, deliberately allowing a message to be intercepted by the enemy. Using this ploy, they were able to find certainty amongst the chaos, which was only able to be determined because of the interpersonal relationship and the precise communication within the Office of Naval Intelligence. Nimitz established a relationship built on confidence. Didn't you try to warn my predecessor about the impending attack? Well, not exactly. I said that we had lost track of the enemy carriers and needed to be prepared. And I should have pushed harder. A lesson, I assume, you have taken to heart. Which enabled them to link intelligence with imagination and find the elusive certainty in the fog of war. Part 3. Keys to Warfare. Speed and adaptability come from flexible organization. Break your forces into independent groups that can operate and make decisions on their own. Make your forces elusive and unstoppable by infusing them with the spirit of the campaign, giving them a mission to accomplish and then letting them run. Robert Greene. The 2003 film, Gods and Generals, is a historically epic film, but a flawed historical depiction of the early years of the American Civil War. I don't usually offer criticism of films that I choose as examples. However, this film in particular displays a problematic depiction of the Confederacy's political motivations for the war, in what is known as the Neo-Confederate Lost Cause, which is a false narrative that slavery was not the political motivating factor to the conflict. Sadly, Lost Cause propaganda plagues many historical and fictional accounts of the American Civil War in popular culture. My son, dead. Then already told you he my boss. Not my master. White folks be killing one another for a while yet. There's still plenty mad and plenty of them. But this here rebel. Give me my freedom papers. The film, however, does accurately present General Stonewall Jackson's expert ability to maneuver his small force of Confederate soldiers around the country during his Shenandoah campaign in order to encircle and surprise the Union Army, which outnumbered Jackson's forces. We must retain the advantage of surprise. We must outflank the flankers, General. We must beat them at their own game. Take your entire corps, General Jackson and destroy the enemy. This leads to a series of humiliating defeats for the U.S. Army early in the war, because its commander Robert E. Lee knew Jackson was competent enough to divide up his forces, and in instances where Jackson would find himself with the opportunity to attack the enemy, he could do so. This created disorder and confusion on the opponent's side, not ever being sure where the enemy truly was. Earlier in the film, we see Union General Ambrose Burnside hesitant to divide his forces before the Battle of Fredericksburg. General Hancock, I certainly appreciate your efforts at reconnaissance, but this possibility has been considered and rejected. The pontoons will be here any time now, and then we'll be able to cross with not only the men, but the wagons and supplies as well. Some attempt to occupy Fredericksburg, and possibly the heights beyond now, while we have it for the taking. We will cross this river when the bridges arrive, and not before. You must understand, I do not have them. Burnside declines, believing the Union Army will prevail with sheer numbers over the Confederate forces, but is proved wrong in the coming battle. Eventually, the Union Army would learn from their mistakes, as depicted in the 1993 film Gettysburg, another historical dramatized film that is far more even-handed on the cultural and political issues of the Civil War. In the beginning of the film, we see Major General John Buford, played by Sam Elliott, and his cavalry unit arriving in Gettysburg with the knowledge that the full Confederate army is on its way to this town. You know what's gonna happen here in the morning? Sir. The old damn rebel army's gonna be here. They'll move through this town, occupy these hills on the other side, and our people get here, Lee will have the high ground, they'll be the devil to pay. High ground? It's as if I can actually see it. We're already done. Already a memory. 
Having lived through the last three years of war, Buford has seen all the Confederate strategies play out, and knowing that the Union generals would be cautious to fight for this town's strategic advantages, including the road running through the town and the surrounding hills. If we hold this ridge for a couple of hours, we can keep them away. We can block that road till the main body gets here. We can deprive the enemy of the high ground. He makes a decision of his own to use his small force to slow the Confederate advance, allowing the slower moving dismounted troops to catch up and take the better terrain for the coming fight. The current general of the Union Army, George Meade, only soon commanded the army days before the battle and had very little to say in how or where this battle was fought. Is this a good ground, General? Very good ground, sir. He was also not long for the job. The officers of the individual units made their decisions based on instinct that they had learned after years of faulty leadership and defeat by the enemy. In both these instances, it was decisions made and executed by competent leaders that led to these victories, not the complete command of the highest authority. John, thank you. I don't think they knew until now what they were up against. Very good. People come in here thinking he's up against two tired cavalry brigades, and instead they'll be hitting two corps of fresh Union infantry. Yes, sir. The situation is very confused. What's happened? Well, sir, I moved in this morning as director. I thought it was only a few militia, but it was dismounted cavalry, sir. Go on, Joe. It started out as a minor scrap with a few militia, and the next thing I know, I'm, I'm tangled with half the Union army. <sighs> Things will get out of control, Mr. Heath. That is why we have orders. Is it possible you could have misunderstood them? No, sir. The key to success being to ensure that you have the right leaders in place to enact the spirit of the overall mission without having to micromanage their entire campaign. Part four, the reversal. There will always be chaos in war. There will always be levels of uncertainty. There will always be those who use chaos and surprise to their advantage. And those who use chaos and surprise to their advantage are just as susceptible to their enemy's use of it as well. Just as the Japanese fleet became cocky after Pearl Harbor, thinking they were the only tricksters on the field. It is important to remember to remain calm when surprised, to act in rational ways, and when it's over, dust yourself off and face the next challenge with the same courage and tenacity that you face all obstacles. Remember, surprise, chaos, and uncertainty can be managed, diminished, but never eradicated. And sometimes all you can control is how you react to chaos. This has been a production of Minimum Effort Media. If you would like to own a copy of the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene, please do so using a link in the description below. That will help benefit the channel. I'll also be giving away a free copy of the book. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber with notifications turned on, like the video, and leave a comment down below. The previous winner was randomly selected by me and is on screen right now. Please contact me at the Lazy Stoic across all social media so I can get your contact information. And thank you for watching.